is, 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 is you can't establish the counterfactual. It's impossible to know what India might look like had the British not been there. The fact that India speaks the world's language, the fact that, that India has a centralised unitary government, um, that, that it is a democracy. That all the things that apologists for empire like to claim credit for, um, the English language, parliamentary democracy, the rule of law, the railways, you know, the, all the, the classic cliches, and for that matter, even tea. Every single one of these things was brought in by the British to advance their control of India, to enhance their profits and serve their interests. Not one was intended principally to benefit Indians. And the fact that when they left, they couldn't take this with them, and we were able then to turn them around to purposes the original um, people who introduced them would never have intended is something that I think is more to the credit of the Indian nationalists than to the Englishman. I'm, I'm so... It's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> Let's talk food. Um, <laughs> uh, you... <laughs> I suppose one of the great problems with history is, 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 is you can't establish the counterfactual. It's impossible to know what India might look like had the British not been there. For example, the British had no intention of imparting education to the masses of Indians and made it very clear they weren't going to spend the money doing that. Um, and indeed, as late as 1930, the American historian Will Durant observed that the entire budget of the British for education in India, from the nursery level to the highest university levels, amounted to less than half the high school budget of the state of New York. And that was for the entire country of India with, at that point, ten times as many people as the state of New York. I suppose one of the great problems with history is, 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 is you can't establish the counterfactual. It's impossible to know what India might look like had the British not been there. The fact is that the British were not interested in investing in education, and even the English language was brought in just to educate a narrow class of sort of interpreters between the governors and the governed, people who would help the British by constituting a, a, a buffer mm. between them and the dirty masses whom they ruled. I mean, that was very much the attitude. Macaulay actually said this in his notorious minute on, on education in India, where he said that we need to create a class of Indians, um, Indian in skin and colour, but English in opinions and tastes and morals and in intellect. That was his exact, those were his exact words. Words, and it was to serve their purposes. Now, the fact that India speaks the world's language, the fact that, that India has a centralised unitary government, um, that, that it is a democracy. Democracy, and you mentioned political unity. Well, mm. Political unity um, is the one that the British point to with pride, that they came into a bunch of warring principalities nice. and they made a country out of it. Not so. Uh, for 2,000 years before the British ever set foot on India, there had been a very clear sense of a common civilizational unity and an aspiration on the part of monarchs to consolidate that territorially. Now, obviously, they couldn't. I mean, we had two uh, people who came very close. There was the Mauryan Empire, Ashoka and, and Chandragupta, who uh, controlled about 90% of the subcontinent, including Afghanistan. Um, and that was, that was the, the extent. But the, the fact that everyone tried to do it, aspired to do it, and failed in trying shows that if the British hadn't succeeded, somebody else around the same time with the advantages of modern communications and so on would have. So political unity was not a British gift. Uh, so it's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. Uh, democracy had to be prized from the reluctant grasp of the British. In fact, the history of the advent of democracy in India, as I demonstrate in the book, is actually littered with the broken promises of, of, of English rulers who keep promising responsible self-government and then sort of yanking it away uh, just when the time came for them to redeem their pledge. Um, and the example after example of this, so I say more or less because the franchise was still limited by literacy and population, so it was not a majority of the people, but still uh, a franchise of votes was offered to Indians properly for the first time in, in 1937. Before that, there'd been elections, but for example, in the 1920s, only one out of every 250 Indians had the vote. So mm. Hardly a training ground for democracy. Um, and, and, and even then, they did not allow people to vote for a national government. The national government was still the British headed by the Viceroy. It was only provincial governments that Indians were allowed to form up to the Second World War. Um, so given also, it's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. The fact that India speaks the world's language, the fact that, that India has a centralised unitary government, um, that, that it is a democracy. I say the British did a great deal to undermine Indian unity. When the Indian National Congress was established in 1885 by well-meaning Scotsmen with various Indian supporters, uh, it was truly um, a body the British could have easily co-opted. It was a bunch of largely Anglophile lawyers who wrote decorous petitions and held very civilised meetings in which they asked the English to give them the rights of Englishmen. Um, but the British saw even this as a threat. So far from welcoming it as a first step towards responsible self-government for Indians, to the extent of helping encourage the the setting up of a rival body 20 years later, the Muslim League, mm. which was set up explicitly on sectarian lines. 
with the British prodding them to say, look, these people will only represent the interests of the Hindu majority. Now, you look at their first 20 presidents, and they're Christians, Muslims, Parsis, as well as Hindus. And there's even an Irish woman, an Irish Catholic, um, uh, Annie Besant the, of the Theosophist movement. So it was a very open, very inclusive uh, body, but the British had no intention of cooperating with it, had no intention of taking it seriously. And these are not retrospective judgments. I've quoted, for example, a Sunday Times journalist from London who traveled in India in 1907, 1908, Henry Nevinson, who attended meetings of the Congress, met British official, officialdom, and recorded his horror at the way in which the British were denying um, fair, uh, due process and, and, and fair rights to, to Indians. So it's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> Let's talk food. Um, <laughs> uh, you... <laughs> <laughs> the fact that, that India has a centralised unitary government, um, that, that it is a democracy. So uh, all this was apparent at the time, and yet the British dragged it out as long as they could. So it's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> Let's talk food. Um, <laughs> uh, you... <laughs> One of, the, one of the great lines of the book is there's never been a famine in a democracy with a free press. Um, one of the striking things that, that, that comes out of this book is the, um, is the widespread starvation that occurs in India during the first half of the 20th century. Can you, can you talk about the famines and, and, and what Absolutely. they did? Absolutely. No, it, it really was a, was, was a horror show what the British did. And if any Irish people in the audience, this will resonate with them because they did the same thing in Ireland. The British had a compound of attitudes. <laughs> widespread starvation that occurs in India during the first half of the 20th century. Can you, can you talk about the famines and, and, and what Absolutely. No, it, it really was a, was, a, was a horror show what the British did at the time that they were ruling India. The first was that one must not give charity because it encourages idleness. The second was the, the rather callous notion, but they justified it in Adam Smithian terms, that the free market must prevail. So if there is a famine and the British government buys the only grain available to ship it off to London for the bread baskets of, of the East End, but the, um, the, the poor people left in India who are starving for food can't afford to buy it because the Brits have driven the price up, well, those are the rules of the free market. It's tough, but that's the way it's going to be. Third was the Malthusian principle, that if the land cannot sustain the population that's trying to live off it, well, people must die. So, so they did. And the final thing, of course, was Victorian fiscal prudence. Thou shall not spend money thou is not budgeted for. So with all of this put together, they refused to help people in famines. Which, so it's a bit rich, as I've said at Oxford, to you know, arrest, maim, uh, imprison, torture, deny rights to a people for 200 years, and then celebrate the fact that they're democratic at the end of it. <laughs> Let's talk food. Um, <laughs> uh, you... Ha, 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 